you for being here. I'm really thankful to be here. It's some amazing setting. Um, so let me take you back two generations ago. What a good doctor meant to be at that time. Before the penicillin was discovered, a good doctor knew it all, did it all, from setting a bone, drawing blood, performing surgery. Fast forward today, information and knowledge has exploded. So it has surpassed us. Now we require a specialist to deliver a complete solution from beginning to end. A lot of specialists are going to be involved. So in the past, we were self-sufficient and that was okay. Today, we need to collaborate. And that's a fact. So my aim here today is to provide knowledge and tools to make this collaboration easier. My name is Ixchel. I'm from Mexico, live in Switzerland. I'm a Java champion. Uh, I work for a company called Three Bodies. And this is me. I love to be on the road. I go to different conferences. This particular one, it's very similar, except for the beach part. <laughs> that one is Jaycrete. This talk came to me because early last year, I started seeing this kind of headlines in the newspapers. Or this one, as I said, I live in Switzerland. So it was bad news. And I wonder why? Why are they saying this kind of things? So I went back uh, to see what it's all about. And if you work with me, you will see that I'm one of those persons that like to know facts, have numbers. So I went back to this, the study that created all, all those headlines, the mix that matter. This was done in collaboration with the Boston Consulting Group and the University, Technical University of Munich. The scope of the study, it was close to home. So it was about Swiss, German, Austrian companies. And the results were quite significant. They found that four of six gender diverse dimensions correlate with performance or innovation or revenue. And why? Well, they were looking at the reasons why this happened. It turns out that if you have a very homogeneous group, you can have redundant ideas. Makes sense. You don't have the third man or the eleventh man to go with the crazy idea and can come with ideas outside of the box. And the other thing that is quite significant is that female managers brought disruptive innovation. The numbers. Turns out that if you have a diverse management manager team in gender, gender diversity, you will get 9% more of revenue in products or services coming from innovation. So imagine that. Now I'm giving you very compelling reasons why to increase the diversity in your teams. It's actually have a direct link with, the, uh, with your return of investments or your revenue. At this point, you should be saying, well, let's just increase diversity. So simple. Yeah, again, Excel went back and started looking for papers, studies, and things like that. Turns out that this idea of diversity in groups has been studied. And there is a lot of papers out there. I recommend this one. In this one, they analyze, for example, the similar attraction paradigm. This is an idea that was born at the end of the 90s. And it has a lot of empirical data. And the idea behind it, it was like this. We tend to fall in love and, we, and work with people that look like us. So as humans, we tend to look and find patterns or groups to belong to. That's human nature. When we go to a new environment, we are 
usually open. We start looking for relationships, and once we form them, we label ourselves like us. And when a newcomer comes that looks a little bit different, then it's him or they. That's human. So they said, well, if you have us versus them, then communication is not correctly or is not very effective. Then you have uh, low cohesion, you have friction. Later on, a new study, a new idea came to be, the value in diversity. Again, several studies with different results. What happens? If you increase the diversity in your teams, if you have different economical background, country of origin, if you have different beliefs, you are going to be exposed to a different perspective. If you have an um, environment where communication, debate exists, then you can leverage an increased pool of networks, information and skills. And if you have an heterogeneous group, then probably that idea that was different, that is actually a creative solution to your problem, may emerge. So here I have several studies that for one side says, Ixchel, if you increase the diversity in your team, you will have innovation, creativity, resilience. And on the other side, Ixchel, if you increase the diversity, you, don't, you will have low cohesion. People don't know how to deal with themselves. They don't know cooperate correctly. The question is, how do we solve that? Turns out that I was not the only one with that question. Google spent two years and interviewed more than 100 teams to figure out what made a good team. Because when they ask managers at Google, how should I compose the team? One said, well, several ones said, maybe we should put the, our stars, the dream team, all our best developers in a, single, in a single team, and we will have the most high productive, amazing thing ever. They will be able to solve whatever problem you put them. The other one said, you know, they have big egos. So why not we put people that share something? Like, for example, hobbies. Others said, why not by personality? Let's put introverts together so they are not bothered with communication in between. What it was more important, they had a certain type of team with an, a specific profile. And they were very successful. They could solve the problem. When they tried to use the same profile of a team, of this team in a different environment, suddenly, where, where there was success, here was failure. So not only, you, I mean, not only by replicating the, the profile, the results were the same. So they knew at that time they didn't have a clue what make a good team a good team. As I said, two years before, after uh, hiring sociologists, psychologists, organizational uh, workers, and tracking a lot of data and analyzing several variables to review and see what the performance was, they came up with this conclusion. How the team behaved, it was more important about who was on the team. And they even came up with uh, these five keys. So they said, they, they actually have, you go and look for Google Project Aristotle's, there is a questionnaire that a lot or most of the Google team have to fill out. And they have, sorry for that, it shouldn't have appeared. And the questionnaire has several, uh, and this questionnaire is based on this kind of questions. Is 
do I feel comfortable enough in my team to point out errors? Can I ask questions? If I make a mistake, am I going to be the party of the team? Can I trust that my coworkers are going to deliver what they, were, they said they were going to deliver on time with a high quality? Is this thing that I'm working on matters or relates to me? Because I'm spending eight hours or more sometimes in this, so it better be important to me. Am I solving a real problem? Is my work meaningful? So they constantly fill out a questionnaire with this question with the sensors, or, and they actually check the health of their team. When I was reading this article and, and the Project Aristotle, it struck me that I didn't know what psychological safety means. As I said, can I ask questions? Can I point out errors? But at the beginning, I didn't know. So. I went back to papers and articles and studies. At first, they described psychological safety like a trusting environment. But later on, they made the distinction. Trust is a relationship, that, it's a relationship between two individuals. I trust you. I trust my friends. I trust my parents. I trust my husband. Psychological environment or psychological safety, it's more about the environment. So for example, in this study that I totally recommend you to read, they made um, a study in two different hospitals and operation rooms. One of them have this concept and the other one hasn't. In the first case, the hospital without psychological safety, they ask the nurses, do you double check with the doctor if you have a question? And they will say, no, no way. He's going to take the, our head off if we actually ask a question. On the other hospital, they had an open doors policy. So any nurse at any point could go into the doctor and say, I have a question. I have a doubt. When they ask the nurses, would you be, how inclined would you be to point out an error? One of the nurses said, never, ever. The other group said, yes, because this is a matter of life and death. So I need to say something if I think there is an error here. So as you can see, it's really important to have psychological safety to make questions point out errors, etc. It looks like trust, but it isn't. And even if we are talking about trust, we have to differentiate something. Even if I trust my best friend to advise me on the best dress I could wear for a night out, probably I will not trust her to make a career decision for me. It's the same. And we have to be aware of that in our working environment. We usually go with the coworker that is the nicest, which we have the best coffee breaks, who is more approachable, instead of going with the person that has the most experience in the specific topic I want to have more information about. So in the work relationship, I, in the work environment, I suggest you to consider who do you trust and why, and make the right decisions. How, how can we introduce a psychological safety environment? It turns out that everything begins from the top to the bottom. So when I refer to the top, it's usually the leader's behavior. But there is a good thing to say here. A leader is not a person with the highest authority. A leader is a person that influence, that has influence in a specific topic. So even if there is a person that is not very high in the authority chain, he, can, he or she can still influence the environment he or she is um, working on. So 
As I said, in one hospital, there was this open door policy. Nobody felt like there was a dumb question. Nobody felt that their standing in the team was going to suffer in case there was a failure or there was a question. The leader always invites for feedback. And I have, I'm going to have a slide about feedback because feedback requires a talk in itself. In the hospital where they practice psychological safety, the doctor usually started when they were practicing new procedure saying, this is a new procedure, we may, we may commit or create or have problems. So he will go into the operation room with all his staff ready and he will say, this is the first time we are implementing this new procedure here. We're going to do it from beginning to end. And I want every single person involved here to speak up, to double check that we are understanding, to mention when we are creating or you have doubts, or to point out errors. And obviously for that you need trusting and respecting relationships. As I said, when you want to introduce a safety environment and you want to introduce new ideas or new methodologies, you have to practice. There is a moment where you decide how things are working and if there is a problem, you can solve it right on time. Organization content support. In, uh, in our industry, it's super easy to now work remotely. So for example, in my last company, we have a team in India. And we were the team in Basel. So it's easy sometimes to first create that distinction. We are team Basel and they are team India, which is wrong. So we are a team and some of their members happen to be in Basel and some of the members happen to be in India. And we should have access to the same resources, the same type of computers, the same quality of network, etc. And it has to be transparent. Why? Because if it's not, then we are reinforcing that idea of us versus them. The other thing is not something that actually we should do. It's actually that something that happens and we have to think about it. Emergent group dynamics. In all corporations, we will see things happening like there is this father figure, there is this mother figure, the black sheep of the family, the poster child. And sometimes when the poster child comes and explains and, and, and suggests an idea and says, wow, I have this idea, it's automatically a good idea because the poster child of the company suggested. If the same idea is presented by the black sheep of the family or the company, then chances are we're going to miss that idea. So be aware of this happens. We cannot avoid it, we're humans. But at least stop, think and react. What happens if you have a psychological safety environment? As I said, we don't have any penalization for asking questions, asking for help. Feedback is going to be well given. Errors will happen and we will be openly accepted. And then if all this happens, we will have an innovating behavior or um, and creative, sorry for that, an innovation as a result. Because then we can expect we can speak up about crazy ideas and they will have the chance to be born and to be better. As I said, feedback, when we talk about feedback, sometimes we talk about different things under the same umbrella. I totally recommend you to also, wow, see, um, look at that book, it's really nice. Because feedback can, be, can come in different ways, as appreciation, coaching, or evaluation. So us, when providing feedback, 
we have to be very sure what type of feedback we are providing. And the person that is receiving the feedback have to understand what they are giving them and how to react correctly to that. But if you want good feedback in a nutshell, I think this comic actually points it out correctly. A good feedback is the one that is positive, specific, and provides a next step. Margaret Heffern, when she speaks about social capital, she explains this idea perfectly. Any idea is born confused and messy. And it's just by us providing them, providing them time and effort and caring that we can create or take any idea to its full potential. And as I said, if we can express ourselves freely, then we can, we can be more creative. I'm not one person that only sees a source and thinks that's the truth underneath the sky. So I was looking, for, I'm always looking for second and third opinions. So I found out this one, this um, article, The Secrets of Ray Twin Work. The authors have been working for 17 years and more than, I think it was 4,200 4, interviews with different teams um, around the world. And they actually found out that what we require to make a good team is having enabling conditions. This idea of enabling conditions was created by Richard Hackman. And Richard Hackman has been working with teams and behavioral teams for more than 40 years. So he creates a list of enabled conditions that we should have in place for teams to work correctly. The authors add another one. They say three are still as current as when they were discovered like 20 years or so ago, but we will add a new one. The enables conditions are compelling direction. We all should know what are the goals. We all should know why are we doing what we are doing. A, st a strong structure. Richard Hammond thought that if we specify the rules of engagement, like in this team, we uh, value trust, we value respect, we value truth, then it was going to be easier to achieve a certain goal. So that's what he called strong structure. Rules of engagement inside the team to be clear. Supporting context is exactly the same as, as in the one in Google. Everybody should have access to the same resources in order to achieve the result. And the one that the authors added was shared mindset. And this was because of the current um, working conditions. We work remotely more more and more. So he said, when you have these teams distribute along time zones and places, it's easy to say that's one part of, the, that's a team and we are another team. So the leaders of the managers have to work really hard into eradicate that idea and said, we are one team and only one team. Yeah, and that was weird. Okay, here I actually, there should have appeared the five keys and the enabled conditions, and you have realized that they are very, very similar. They actually overlap in a lot of concepts. But let's assume now I have the best psychological safety in place in my team. I can ask questions, provide feedback, I can say, oops, I made a mistake, nothing will happen, people are going to listen to me. What happens if I'm not so very inclined to talk to people? To tell you the truth, I'm an introvert. Actually, it's very difficult for me to be here in front of you talking. And I can do well during conferences, but after a conference, I'm depleted. So I won't talk to anybody. 
for a long period of time. So how my introvertness actually plays a role in my team? First of all is know yourself a little bit. And I'm going to talk about ocean, which is a dimensional, personality dimension and study. And it's created by Brian Little. At this point, you have probably have heard the big five, uh, Myers-Briggs, as uh, different tests for personality. I like Ocean for two reasons. First is validated accord, um, across different countries and different cultures, which the other ones are not so good at that. And the second reason you will see in three slides ahead. So, Dr. Little says that we have different dimensions in our personality. You probably are very, very familiar with extroverts or introverts. That was uh, created or, yes, by Carl Jung. And he actually said something interesting. This is a dimension, we are, we are all extroverts or introverts in a certain degree. You won't ever find a pure extrovert or a pure introvert. That's not possible. So it's the same with all the dimensions. We all be a little bit neurotic, or we all be a little bit extrovert or introvert, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And that personality can um, it, they can they are related to different kind of behavior. For example, people that are um, rate high on openness are usually the people that are willing to try new things. And this is interesting because if you're willing to try new things, it means that you're open yourself for failure because it's a new thing that you don't know how to do it. So they are open to failure. They can be vulnerable, but also that gives them creativity and mental flexibility. People that uh, rate high in conscientiousness. There are people that are willing to delay their satisfaction or their gratification in order to follow a certain process. So once there is a process in place, they believe that they need to follow the process from beginning to end. It doesn't matter if they don't feel very comfortable doing. That is the way and we should follow the way. So they are very responsible, and you can trust they will finish the task. Extroversion, people that are looking for more people to interact. They are usually the center of attention. They like to speak loudly. They move a lot. Uh, you will always notice they are there. There is no way you can miss one extrovert. Agreeableness, it kind, of sound, it kind of sounds like extrovert, but this is slightly different. One is how much exposure I'm looking for, and this is I want everybody to like me. So I'm going to try different things until I feel accepted. So I'm very friendly, and probably I'm going to be very oriented to the people. Neurotics. I don't like the description of this dimension, and it's changing, that's good. In the past, a neurotic was a moody people that had um, negative emotional states. So people, companies were going against or away from neurotics. But there's a lot of articles that you can read outside um, about the rise of neurotics in management teams. Why is that? First of all, they underpromise and overdeliver because they are like the agreeableness oriented oriented towards how do people see me. They are also looking into do not disappoint others. They are super worried about that. So now it turns out that there are companies that are trying to hire neurotics for their management, which is good. 
The second reason why I'm talking about ocean is because, for example, InfoQ made um, an interview to Dr. Little and asked him, is there any way we can improve software, dyna the software development with personality traits? Is there is a recipe where we can say, oh yes, take one introvert and one extrovert and then everything will work? Well, he doesn't say it like that, actually. But we all need in our team, or we usually have in our team, one developer that is willing to try the newest library, the newest build to every single shiny toy that is out there, he will want to try it. So it's good, because sometimes it was not the best tool, but there are other times where it actually solves the problem. Conscientiousness, you always need somebody, or we always have, that teammate that is always reminding us that the committed message should have a special format, that we should follow a certain uh, coding styles, no tabs, just spaces, etc., 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 or the naming conventions, which is good because then we have consistency. Extroverts, you always need an extrovert in your team. Why is that? Because you need to create the sense of we are a team. So he will nurture that in your team. He doesn't talk about agreeableness, but for me, I have seen it in my teams. When you have this really nice and strong personalities, you need somebody in the middle that play the referee. So for me, it's really important to have someone that is high in agreeableness. And as I said, neurotics now are more welcome in the industry just because you also need a person that is worried about all the things that can go wrong. That patch of security you didn't install, he will take that into consideration. Does that mean that we are doomed? If I'm high in introversion, but high in openness, that's it? Big shell, you are doomed? No. There is a resource that we can use. We can out act of character, out of love, or to advance in our professional careers. But if we engage into these activities for too long, we run the risk to burn out. So Dr. Little says what we need to have is restorative niches. So in my case, an introvert coming to, to conferences, speaking here, it's a free trade that I'm going to pay daily after the conference. So be sure that you have these restorative niches in your teams. I mean, as the previous, as the previous uh, slides shows, not all the introverts in your team are going to be very happy about having five meetings per day. No, understand that they are not wired that way. Don't ask a neurotic to forget about all his concerns about security because that's not going to happen either. Don't try to say a, a person that is very open no, we are not going to try any single new library. No, we are not going to update any version, etc. because you are going to damage a little bit your team. So as we can see, diversity comes in different dimensions. Country of origin, age, academic background. Um, what else? Career. We can also find diversity in our teams because of our personalities. And if you consider all these dimensions in itself, and if you mind them, and if you prepare situations or environment where you have psychological safety, context, support, it doesn't matter what is the composition, 
you will have a successful team. So this is my message to you. Thank you very much. Questions? No, it's not. I'm always ready. <laughs> no, no, no. It's because I, I, I mean, this is also something really important that I like to share. Um, in China, they, they follow the Chinese calendar. So when there is the dragon year, there is a lot of couples that actually plan to have their babies during the dragon year. Because it's said that people that are, war are born in the dragon year, they are going to be amazingly successful. They are going to be rich. They are going to be intelligent. So if you are going to have a child, this is your year. So in the schools, obviously, at that time, there's a lot more kids during that year and schools and everything. So they were actually looking, are dragon children really better than, the, than horse or rat or whatever children of other years? And it turns out that consistently they were scoring better. So at first they said, no, the teachers are also biased. Because they think that they have dragon children, then they are going to score them higher. Then they say, no, let's do IQ tests. They were almost the same. Uh, let's ask dragon children, do you feel better than a horse children? And they said, no, not really. But when they went into college, they were actually doing better. So there was data that show, yes, they are better. They don't feel better. They don't actually are better. So what is happening? Turns out that it was the expectation of the parents that were transmitted to the children. So the children work harder just to meet the expectation of the parents. What did I, why did I bring up this topic? Because this is also my way of saying to you, expect more from your teams and be prepared to be surprised when they meet that expectation. Well, now I'm finished. <laughs> Promise I, you can go now. <laughs>